Okay, so hi everyone and welcome to today's session. Thank you for joining us. If you've been with us before, welcome back. But if you're new to joining our sessions, um, it's great to have you with us today. My name's Jennifer Blundell. I'm the International Marketing Manager here at Premier Codex. And I'm just gonna run you through a few things initially and then we can get started. So we've been running our Formation Dam Damage webinar series over the past few weeks now. This is our fourth technical session. So some of you may be familiar with us already. Um, and today, Justin Green, our Formation Damage Consultant is back giving us some insight into improved sanding and sand assessment control and addressing some of the key questions surrounding the topic. So please feel free to participate and interact with us. We are here for your questions and queries as much as presenting the topic for you today um, and hope you can take away as much value as you can from these sessions. So yeah, as I say, please do feel free to ask Justin any questions you might have as we run through the session. You'll see how to do that in the Q&A function in the control panel at the bottom of your screen. And we would ask that you direct any of your questions through this function. Uh, there's a chat function you'll see as well there, but for specific questions, it's best just to use the Q&A and Justin will easily be able to see them pop up on his screen from there. We'll stop every so often to answer questions for you. Um, we might leave a few more in-depth questions till the end, but we will come back to them um, and then we'll have some more time at the end for further questions as well. So we'll aim for the session to last around 45 minutes to an hour today. So thank you very much. That's all from me for now. I will pass you over to Justin now and he will just give us a brief introduction and then he'll get us started. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Uh, Good morning or afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, thanks for coming along. So this week's topic we're going to talk about, as Jennifer said, is sands control. I think we could just as easily have called it solids control because it doesn't have to be sand. We can see we can see this sort of thing in carbonate reservoirs as well. Uh, but I'm going to call it sand control for the rest of it. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me or hasn't attended any of these webinars, I'm sure you've had a look at the bio that's on the screen and Premier Corex, part of the Premier Oil Field Group. Um, who are US-based Premier Corex, have major labs here in Aberdeen, where I'm speaking to you from, uh, in Cairo, in Egypt. We have a lab in Kuwait and in Abu Dhabi as well, as well as a lab and core storage facility in Noida, in Delhi, in India. So we're spread about. We do core analysis, formation damage, rock mechanics, anything related to rock and fluids, basically generating and analyzing data. So let me disappear my face from this and we'll get on with the slides. So today we're talking about sanding, solids control, these little things that are the problem. Um, sanding, another one of these subjects that's pretty big and pretty broad industry-wide. And I'm obviously going to try and put this in a formation damage context. So sanding, I think, Everybody knows sanding is important. Why is it important? Things like wellbore stability or instability, casing and hole collapse, lost production, facilities, handling, sand separation, cost of fixing sanding issues, environmental cost. And then kind of behind all that is, or related to all that is formation damage. So I'm not really gonna talk too much about the fundamentals and the reasons we think about sanding so much. I will touch upon that in the uh, prediction part of, of this uh, webinar, but I'm really going to focus on it in a formation damage context. And when I think of it in a reservoir, formation damage, whatever you want to say, I think here's some of the key questions we're going we're gonna to try and think about, or we should be thinking about, which are, will I see sanding in the first place? Because if we're not going to see sanding, then the subject is not so relevant. We don't have to worry about this but if we have sanding we need to start thinking about things about like reservoir permeability let's forget about before it's left the reservoir inside the reservoir can it hurt it outside the reservoir is my sanding problem significant enough that i need some sort of sand control hardware can i do it without hardware can i you know this is again outside of what i'm going to talk about but we can do things like orientation of wet reservoirs or well should i say orientation of perforations but then when we need control hardware do I need it? What type of hardware is best for me? Is it standalone? Is it expandable? Is it wire wrap screen? What size is best for my formation? And then if I know I'm going to need to select that, 
how do I select this hardware and not miss things, choose the one that's best for my formation. And then really importantly, as a formation damage guy, does it hold back the sand? But does it contribute any additional damage we didn't expect in the reservoir? So I think that these are some of the themes I'd like to touch upon today. Now I'm sure we've got a range of expertise watching the webinar this morning. So for some people, I'm gonna cover some stuff that's probably a bit basic, but I'm gonna build up through kind of like the three ages of sand control, if you like. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about first, or in, the, in a few minutes about sort of traditional techniques for understanding the reservoir, how that's used for sand control selection into stuff that's, you know, in this century, let's say, things like sand retention testing, where we use more advanced techniques to select screens and hardware, and then looking to the current and future, which is utilizing new scanners, new modeling uh, capabilities that is coming along fast in the industry. So I want to maybe look at it in three steps, look at some basic stuff, an introduction for some people who are not familiar with it, and then talk about what we do in industry, where there's possibly some room for improvement in those techniques. Now I said I'm gonna talk about an information damage context. So yeah, as I said, as, as a formation damage guy, I think these are some of the things that we should be considering or questions that we should be asking and trying to answer when we know that we might have a sanding problem. First up, and this is, you know, not even formation damage, if you like, this is reservoir scale properties, petrophysics properties. Does the reservoir changing as it sands have an impact on permeability? We all know that as you change the reservoir pore pressure, there's a potential for the permeability to change, pore volume compressibility. Um, and that might be exacerbated in sanding reservoirs, and that might cause additional things like funds migration. I'll touch upon that later on, but just the process of sanding might cause some change in the permeability. That's more or less unavoidable, but we would like to know about these sort of things. Sand control hardware, you know, we can generally select hardware based upon rules of thumb and industry standards, but each sand is relatively unique. So, one particle, one sand with a D50 of 200 and one of 180 might be similar on paper, but they might be quite different in properties of shape and things like that. So what is best for specific sand? I'd always want to be saying, how does my sand behave with the specific screen type? Another thing we need to consider is that when we run sand control, whether it's gravel pack, whether it's standalone screens, other types of sand control, we're probably going to introduce one or more new operational fluids or operations into the sequence. That might mean something as simple as displacing a drilling mud with a screen drilling mud um, uh, or a low solids drilling mud or a low solids uh, fluid. Or it might be more complex. In a gravel pack case, it might be displacing out the drilling mud with a, a solids laden fluid, then a, a viscosified clear fluid, and then finally to a brine. These are all things in the formation damage world. We know when you introduce new fluids, they can interact with each other, they can interact with the reservoir. So if there's new fluids in the sequence, as well as new potential restrictions, which I count the screen and gravel as, and we'll talk about that later, then we're creating new question marks. And if we just think about, oh, we've got a good mud, we've got a good screen, is there a knowledge gap there when we introduce the new fluids? So that's what I'm saying there, is the new well operational sequence an issue? We'll, we'll, we'll come back onto that. And then, sort of aligned to that and it's not unusual and especially in gravel pack wells when we don't get full cleanup of drilling fluid operational fluid cakes is to use a treatment either built into the the um, carrier fluid for the gravel pack or as a sort of post remedial treatment a treatment fluid to try and make that damage or the cleanup improve and the question here is do they work or do they add additional damage and aside on that, because if anyone's been to any of my previous presentation webinars we've been running, it's I've been banging home the point that the closer we get to field reservoir conditions, the better the data is going to be. And I say that in core flood testing. So why are we not all saying that in sand control testing? I'll talk about that in sand retention testing. So, you know, is the industry standard good enough at the moment is a question I'd like to ask. So just, you know, if we think about the two, th two key things, I think we need to think about in sand, sanding reservoirs is we need to make sure we get the selection of the sand control hardware correct, and I'll talk about that next. And then minimizing any damage caused by what we do to place that sand control hardware. And I think they, this, that's one of the key takeaways from today, and we'll talk about some of the detail of that uh, shortly. 
So taking a step back first, before we look at how we select the hardware, let's th just for, for those who are not familiar with some of the techniques we use to predict sanding. I think industry-wide people use various different things, but I think modeling is very common. I think log derived models and numerical models are quite, quite, uh, quite common, as well as pure analytical direct measurements on the core. And that's what I'm, what I'm showing here you know, we're from, a, from a lab side. What you're seeing here in the pictures is our lab across in Houston. We've got a fantastic geomechanics lab across there with these great huge scale kits. And what this is, is rock mechanics, geomechanics testing. And that's usually essential to understand the specific properties of the reservoir to help a create the right models or the right conditions in the models and also to calibrate log derived models we might need some sonic or, or some unconfined strength on the rock samples to help calibrate that log derived model which is used to predict the rock strength and sanding envelopes one of the most common important rock mechanic tests that we see in the sanding context is that the second one you see on the list there twc thick walled cylinder that's where with an unconfined compressive strength it's taking a cylinder of core and basically squeezing it between two plates and looking at the failure point it's more complicated than that but that's basically what we're looking at what stress does it take to fail the rock thick walled cylinders are a bit more involved where we have either core plug size if people are familiar with plugs one inch one and a half inch three inches or whole core sizes and a hole basically a, a well bore drilled up the middle of that and a uh, drawdown essentially placed across that and looking at sanding looking at failure and that gives lots of good information on sanding these tests all give good information on that help the models and this and the geomechanics guys predict when we're going to see sanding if we're going to see sanding and if it's likely to happen under the conditions our reservoir is going to produce that and you know that might be a no or a low chance of sanding in which case we're not really so concerned about uh, sand control it might be a it might be an answer which is always an interesting one that sanding will happen later in life with high with, as we get more depleted and then the question is should we put the sand control in at the start of the well life cycle or should we are we going to go back and intervene later that's got a logistical and a economic cost to it as well so many people are looking at even with mild sanding problems putting something like a standalone screen in early doors so even with mild sanding they're doing stuff to help select sand control and get that right before the sanding becomes a problem so that's just a quick overview of some of the prediction stuff i'd like to maybe take a, a step sideways on that because when we think of sanding we think of it as what happens when the sand comes outside the well or so outside the reservoir should i say but I'd also like to think of it in a, inside the reservoir at the prediction site stage of it. So, you know, what does sanding happen? What impact does it have outside the well? I think inside the well is really important as well because sanding, you see here, we've got, this is an SEM image of a loosely, poorly consolidated sand. This is a sand grain that's, that's come out of it and been caught on a filter during a test. So stuff is leaving the rock, likewise, this is a inside the pore of a sandstone. We've got a pore through here and here. We have to flow through this pore and this fine. These kaolinite plates can potentially be picked up through the pore network and leave. And you can see this again has left the sample. But then let's think about inside the pore network. You know, this grain doesn't have to leave the pore network. It just has to get jammed in a pore through. Or as the pressure changes, some of the shape and size of these pores just have to change. And we see a permeability reduction within the pore network here. As this pore throat gets smaller, if the grains rearrange or we see compression with sanding, this becomes more likely to be a problem. So as the pore network and the rock changes during sanding and sand production, then we could actually see formation damage kind of snowballing inside the reservoir. So we, we talk about sanding, but I think fines migration and rock properties changing go hand in hand with that. They can also be used to help predict the level of sand that will leave the reservoir. I'll show you, show you an example um, of, of the kind of study I'm talking about here, which is, we, they get called critical velocity, fines migration, flow rate dependency, critical drawdown. It's a fairly simple test is, you know, looking at, can we get a bit of reservoir rock? Prepare that to reservoir conditions, be that oil well, gas well, water leg, and then look injector producer, and then simulate the range of rates of injection or production we'd expect to see through the rock, look at the permeability, and then do things like catch the effluent and measure the 
concentration and size of what's leaving the rock. And that can be used to help understand what's going to potentially get outside the reservoir. But also, just something I think we should be thinking about and we don't always think about in a sanding reservoir, what impact could the sanding have on, on the permeability and therefore the productivity itself? And that's not necessarily something you can avoid, but it's something it's important to know about because if we start losing half of the permeability, we might not lose half of the productivity, but it may affect the economics and the models of how our production will happen. Here's some typical data from a North Sea reservoir. So you can see we tested four different rock types, four different colors, and we flowed at a range of, these were selected to be representative of well conditions. So we did two, 10, 20, 50, and 100 mils per minute through the rock. And what we did was we flowed at the given rate and went, then went back to a baseline low rate to remeasure the permeability. So we're comparing like with like. The base rate may have been one mil a minute. So what we may have done is measured the perm at one mil a minute, flowed at two, measured the perm at one, flowed at 10, measured the perm at one, flowed at 20, et cetera. So these were comparable permeabilities after a series of flows. And what we want to see is, is there a change in behavior? This is where people think you can identify a critical rate or you can at least re re identify ranges of rates. And you can see, I think, without diving deep into the interpretation, you know, all of these rock types were at least slightly susceptible to fines migration. You can see even at a couple of mils a minute, all the rock with any flow, we're seeing some changes of the, the rock was kind of resorting itself and we're seeing fines migration and sanding from a few percent to 15 or 20 percent. And then with time, that's the interesting thing in, in these kind of fines migration or critical velocity testing, does it change? So for example, in the yellow rock type, the top one here, it's not really changing very much as we change the rates. So there's not really, it's not really snowballing or increasing, increasing the, the sanding and fines migration. Whereas with this, this, this one with the X is the blue one here, we're seeing that once we get above this 10, 10 mils a minute rate, it just kind of dives down. So if you're talking about critical velocity or ranges of rates where there's a problem with this particular rock type, we're starting to see it jump off a cliff from 10% drop to 30% drop in between this 10 and 20 mils a minute range with this particular sample and it carries on downwards. This one is the most sensitive to fines migration sanding. Then you can see the reverse of that. You can actually see with the, the green triangle one here, we actually, our permeability is in improving as we increase the rate, and that's probably showing to us that we're stripping out fines and sand from the reservoir and increasing the permeability, whereas in the, the blue one, we're, we're blocking pores and uh, decreasing the permeability. Now, one thing that's very important to say is on a core plug sample level scale, it's relatively easy to strip clay fines, transport them a few centimeters through a core plug and out of a rock. In the reservoir, in a production setting, we may have hundreds of meters coming from large volume to a small volume. So when we actually see permeability improvements, that's actually a, in, in a fines migration or sanding core flood, that's actually a sign to us that it may be a drop in the reservoir because as you increase the concentration and distance, you'd expect at some point this will turn round into a reduction. But that's just an example of fines migration type testing and the kind of interpretation you get off that. As I said, you can get some really good information if you capture the effluent, you can measure the size of that effluent with a PSD and you can measure the concentration. This is an SEM, so we can see what was there, but we can also measure the size and concentration, which can be useful information, whilst not quantitative of what you'd expect to see in your separators or coming out of the well. They can give an idea of the level of sanding we expect to see. And we can also use advanced 3D scanning techniques to see where the fines and sanding or where the damage is happening. And you can see in this sample, we've got these kind of stars, if you like, these dots throughout it. So rather than it just being an accumulation in one end or the other, what we were seeing here was lots of little individual pores that were being affected by the sanding changing and the grains changing and the fines migration accumulation. So that's just an aside on, on sanding in terms of core flooding in the predictive part of it, because I think we maybe think of it as dynamic and static, static rock mechanics, PSD, things like that dynamic core flooding and these are usually done in the kind of prediction phase of a study once it's been predicted that's when we come on to thinking about what do we do about it in terms of sand control what are the criteria for sand selection and we, we actually in our last uh, webinar with Jules we tried a poll out so Jennifer's going to throw up a poll here to see if we can get uh, get some get some people to answer what they're thinking so 
what I'd, what I'd like anyone who's had any in, in interaction with sand control before, I'm just curious to see what, what people's thoughts are on what you have seen sand control being selected, what criteria, has it been just PSD? You should see a poll on the screen now, if you, if you can vote, that would be good. Is it just PSD that you're seeing? Are you seeing PSD plus formulas, rules of thumb being applied? Are you seeing sand retention testing coming into it? Or are you seeing something more advanced than that? Maybe I'll, I'm just gonna pause for a second to give everyone a chance to, to vote on that one. And then we'll talk about some of these, these criteria and what they, what they actually mean. I don't know if Jennifer, um, you close the uh, vote when it's uh, finished or not, I don't know. Maybe I'll carry on talking while the, I've still got the poll up on my screen, but maybe I'll carry on talking as, as the, the poll is ongoing. So what I've done here is I've done a bit of a literature search and found some of the examples where people have shared how, they, uh, how the sand control is selected, some of the criteria you can see. And it ranges from relatively simple to quite complex in terms of first initial go overs on it. And you know, I've circled some of the things that we see being key ones. We've got this from uh, an Imperial College PhD uh, dissertation where there's this whole flow chart for, for sand control thinking about economics, well orientations but the things where it comes to the screen selection they've got things like sorting grain size uniformity which is related to sorting as well basically the how uniform the sand is are all the grains the same size or do we have a range of sizes you see grain size so this is a gravel pack design example here with six times d50 is the gravel uh, size you're seeing here this is a, a, a paper that did a review of various different types for the screen width and they're talking about the width of the screen which is w using d10s and d50s which is when i say d10 d50 for anyone who's who's uh, not sure about that we that is the percentile of the grain size so d50 is the 50 percent of the grains are larger than that um and uh they're quite commonly used as well here we have the this is from the weatherford website where this is the, their screen selection where they plot grain size against uniformity and use that as a rule of thumb for for selecting selecting the screens um jennifer i don't know did you, i didn't see the results from the poll i don't know if, if you saw them if you did maybe you could switch on your microphone and tell us what they are yeah no problem so majority of people 43 percent are seeing sand retention testing um then 29 percent just psd and 21 percent something more advanced Good. Thanks very much, Jennifer. That's good. Well, actually, that tells me that we've got a good crowd on here that know at least uh, and, and at least a bit of what I'm talking about and will be talking about because a bunch of people are familiar with sand retention, which is good. So I can I can show you an overview of that in the next couple of slides, but then I can really zoom in on some of the issues with sand retention that we need to improve going forward. But yes, and, and I think what we'd seen before the advent of doing a lot of sand retention testing, which happened, let's say, Turn, turn of the century, about 2000 and onwards is when sand retention started snowballing. Various procedures started developing. I know that uh, I saw that Alan Twynham was on the call there. I remember back in, back in the day when my early days at Corex, we started developing sand retention testing alongside BP to help design a procedure for choosing screen hardware. And so sand retention is very commonly used. Once we've got this rule of these typical criteria here of what sort of screens should I be using, the next thing is, should we be do some, doing something more than that? And that's where sand retention comes in, because these are all very good, you know, like understanding these rules of thumb, these formulas or these ideas for what a typical screen size should be. We do have to consider um, what about my specific sand? So there's lots of properties of sand, and this is not a geology web webinar today, but I, I like to throw up this one that any geologist has seen this a million times in their life. And I think it's really illustrative of why we should be considering the specific formation in the sand, sand control and why things like sand retention testing are vital and why getting them closer to reservoir is even more vital. So I just, if I circle just the well-rounded grains at the top here, we've got two different grain shapes there. We've got the two ends there. We've got the high sphericity grain here, which is basically a spherical sand grain rounded. And we have a low sphericity where you can see, you could call it tablet shaped or tabular or pill shape, whatever we want to call that. And a question I say there is, will they interact with the screen and gravel in the same way? You know, we've got this where the all axes are the same. So you'd expect if the slot size is appropriate, no matter which orientation it hits that slot or that wire, that weave, 
it should behave similarly. Whereas when we have these kind of elongated grains here, yes, if it hits it along the long axis, but if the slot is smaller than the, than the sort of should I say slot is wider than the smaller axis of this, it's got a potential to slot through it. And will that slotting through be the same with different screen types? So let's say we have a weave screen where it might pass through that first layer, but then it's going to get potentially jammed deeper into the screen. But when we have a wire wrap screen where we just have essentially a single screen filtration uh, or sand filtration layer, it might slot through quite easily through that. So missing specific formation properties, which are a lot more than just this grain shape. But I think this is really illustrative of why we need to think about, can we do something specific to my reservoir and the my potential screen options? And that's where, again, a good half of you have heard, at least heard of, I know that you're using sand retention testing, which is great because you know that's the bare minimum we need to be doing is something which is closer to reservoir, using reservoir sand if possible. Now, sand retention testing, I've been showing these webinars, high-tech, formation damage, reservoir conditions. Sand retention testing tends to be, although it isn't exclusively, quite simple, quick tests. So, so you see two different types talked about quite a lot. Slurry, pre-pack we call it, sand pack, you sometimes see it. Slurry is the easiest one to understand. You have a screen loaded into some sort of hold, screen holder. Gravel, if you have gravel under consideration, if it's a standalone or expandable, you don't need the gravel. And then you have an inlet and you, what you do is you flow a suspension of sand. 1% is industry standard. You see different, you see lower and higher concentrations. But you flow a suspension of sand through the screen and gravel pack. You measure the pressure buildup as a sand pack builds up on the screen. You measure, if you can, the pressure across the screen and the pressure across the whole system. And then what you do is you look at what comes through the screen, PSD, the concentration of the effluent. And from that, you can derive a few things which are important. I guess the two main things that are important in terms of screen selection are, you know, does the screen plug and what gets through it? And, you know, we could say that a, a third derivation of both of those is flow resistance. How resistant is the screen to flow? And that's looking at the pressure buildup. But, you know, quite simple criteria, quite simple metrics of does it block? Does the pressure go high? What gets through in particle size? And this typical test called a slurry test, as I said, is just a 1% by volume. A gen, it's sort of meant to represent sort of gradual, gentle sanding with, you know, dumping sand onto the screen. It's just a gentle production of sand at 1% volume, typically for a litre or so. Um, through through the rock, through the screen, should I say? And the right hand one here, the pre pack, that looks at a different scenario where you actually put a pre made sand pack. It's almost like the end point of once you build up a sand pack here. It's almost your start point to a pre pack where that looks at where you have conformance of the screen straight against the formation or you have a well or whole collapse onto the screen. And it looks at a different scenario where you start to flow fluid through a sand pack or the rock itself. Again, we're not going to dive deep into the procedures on sand retention, but it's used very commonly within independent labs, within operator labs, within the vendors to look at screen selection, screening out, if you pardon the pun, of various screen sizes and narrowing it down to the most appropriate or best performing range of screens for the formation. Of course, there may be other things. There may be um, economics. There may be one screen vastly more expensive than another, but performing similarly. And that's going to be the, the, the cheaper one, maybe the one that's chosen. There may be a yard sitting with a whole load of screen one available and screen two performs slightly better. But is there an argument for it being used over that? So this kind of study is used as a, one of the pieces of the jigsaw, not this is what you, which screen you use. Because again, and I'll talk about it in a second, it's not at reservoir conditions, not at reservoir rates. And it does use things like viscosified and dense fluids. And I will talk about that. But first, I'll show you some examples of sand retention testing data. So here, this is, uh, again, real life data. So for each screen, there's two lines, because I showed you in the gra graphic here, we measure the, you can measure the outlet pressure, and then we can measure the pressure just above the screen or just above the gravel, if we have a gravel pack, and then at the top of the system. So you can, by subtraction, you can measure the pressure across the screen and the pressure across the whole system. So you've got the lower line of the two here is the pressure across the screen, and you've got the pressure across the whole system. And in our setup here, this particular test, you can see we've actually flowed 1,500 millilitres of solids laid in sand. Then there's a small gap in the data there. 
And what we've done is just flowed clear fluid after that to see if the sand pack breaks down or erodes. So we're actually seeing a sand pack build up. So if we look at the green data, which is nice, easy to understand, we're seeing as we start to build up a sand pack, the pressure across the screen goes up. It fairly quickly levels off because a sand pack, a permeable sand pack is built up and it stayed dead level for the rest of this test, which is showing the screen is not plugging. But as the sand pack builds up, the pressure across the whole system is carried on increasing. That's simply a function of Darcy's law because, you know, we have a, a thicker sand pack, it's going to be a thicker pressure drop as long as it's not infinite permeability. So we have a sand pack building up. And then as we remove the slurry part of it and go to just clear flow, it stays stable. So again, we're not seeing erosion of the sand pack. So in this case, the screen is doing its job. Now this, we've got three data sets here. And you can see it's quite interesting, I think, because we've got a weave screen, which is this green one. And we've got two wire wrap screens. Both of them are at 230 microns. So the red one here is 230 microns. And this yellow one here is 230 microns. But what we've seen time and time again, and this does relate to the geometry of the grains, the screen geometry, the sorting, the specifics of that screen and that reservoir, is you can see quite wildly different results from screens that are on paper the same or similar. So again, like looking at these three data sets, sand A, same sand with all of them, same size with all of them, just three vendors. But you can see this yellow one, what's happened is we've got a, not vertical, but a near vertical line. This screen has blocked up as soon as that sand hit it and it stopped. You know, we can get more, more than 300 mils of throughput before the pressure limits were ex exceeded. Whereas with the vendor B with the wire wrap screen, yes, the pressure buildup was relatively high, compared to this green one, but it didn't block. It took a while to build up a, a sand pack there, but once it did, it was all right. And the pressure across the whole system did level off eventually there. Whereas with the, with the weave screen here, you can see nice, relatively low pressure, no blockage of the screen. So in this kind of, the kind of interpretations you get from this data, this yellow one definitely failed. It blocked up. Then these two down here, the wire, the, the, the vendor B and vendor C, they passed. And I think if you're talking about flow resistance, screen plugging, green is preferable because it has a lower pressure across the screen, lower pressure across the whole system. So that's a preferable result. But then there may be other factors which are leading you. You may have a contract, for example, with vendor B already. So the, these two screens passed with the ranking being that the wire wrap screen was ranked one, this was ranked two, and this was ranked three and failed the test. Interestingly enough, with the higher differential pressure, one thing you might say is a higher differential pressure could show that sand pack was developing with the lower differential pressure, you might just be letting lots of sand pass through the screen. That didn't show, this is the versus time, the concentration in effluence, but you can see green versus red. The, the green is slightly higher on the long, you always see a flux at the start as you build up the sand, but you know, as your sand pack is built up, yes, the green at the lower pressure is letting mildly more sand through than the red one, but, it, this is low numbers. These are all good numbers. So the green is lower pressure without letting higher amounts of sand through. So this is, you know, these are past the, past the test. And as I said, you can also do PSD on this effluent to make sure it's, let, it's letting through what it should be letting through and not missing that. Other things you can see on sand retention, a picture sometimes tells a, a million words. So this is, you can actually look at the sand packs as you take them out. So here we have different sands with different, so you can see we've got sieved sand here. So this is the left hand here is the sand pack, sand pack, sand pack. For some reason we flip this image, there's the sand pack. This is propent and we have sieved sands here and looking at various different sands and propent and, and combinations, you can actually see them visually performing different. So here, just comparing the fine and medium sand with the same gravel, basically, you can see that with the fine sand, it's gone into the gravel pack. So you can actually see at this end, the gravel looks fairly untouched, but you can actually see a profile of the sand, fine sand forming a sand pack inside the gravel, which I guess it's supposed to do. Whereas with the medium, it didn't. It basically formed a relatively low permeability layer here. And that's just maybe a sign that the gravel is good for this sand, but it's a little bit conservative for this sand and it's formed a low permeability interface here. So rather than the gravel, acting as a filter throughout like it is here. It's basically a lower permeability, permeability interface. You can zoom right into that and you can see this is one of these scenarios where we have a, a you know, fairly thin interface where we have sand pack propent. This is you know, a, a ceramic propent. And you can actually see, I can see from where my pointer is, this is the interface. You can see about that thick, it's about five 
propent grains thick. There's like an internal filter cake inside the propent, but then it's deeper than that. It's it's not there. So it, the 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 propent sizing was probably a bit conservative there, probably a bit fine. So it was not allowing sand to go any deeper into it, which is a problem in that that's an interface of low permeability rather than spreading it throughout the propent or gravel pad, whatever we want to call it. And you could also look at the screens and see how they block up as well. So here we have a wire, a weave screen, should I say, and a wire wrap screen, and we can start to see sand build up and whether there's open apertures or closed apertures. So that's sand retention testing, traditional industry standard stuff. There's slightly different techniques. There was a joint industry project done quite a few years back now where we tried to compare everyone's equipment, everyone's techniques, and what we saw unsurprisingly was small changes in the equipment and procedure could have big impacts on, on the test results. I'll touch upon that very slightly on my, on my next slide as well. So for those of you that are familiar with sand retention, you may be familiar with some of the limitations, but I think it's very important to raise some of these because these are where we are potentially missing things in the field scenario. And this is where we need to be improving things. And I'm going to show you what we as Premier Corex have done our attempt of it to imp improve these things for the field. So number one, and this is this will vary upon the exact type of equipment, but every bit of sand retention testing equipment tends to have a pressure rating which minimizes the options on test conditions. Hardly any of them will test at reservoir pressure and temperature. So that limits that. So it tends to be done at room, low pressures, low rates of flow through, through, through the sand packs. More important than that almost is the kind of back pressure that the systems can take depends on the pumps that people use, but you can see the maximum pressure that's allowed in a sand retention testing typically being tens of PSI rather than the hundreds of PSI that we can and we know we can see in field in the field across sand packs and across screens. So that can minimize it and miss things like failure or blocking of screens. So the solution to that is to design higher pressure equipment, obviously. Constrictions, tortuosity in the flow path and it can cause artifacts in it. So what I mean by that, and it's the really interesting one because we've actually, during this joint industry project, what we did was we took our lab, our sand retention lab, and an operator lent us their bit of kit that they did the sand retention testing on. And we put them side by side and we used the same sand, the same screen, and we ran the tests at the same time, basically. And the same person running them, so the person wasn't variable. And what we saw was we saw with our equipment versus the operator equipment, we were seeing a higher differential pressure as we flowed the slurry through the screen with the operator's equipment. And what it was, was our bit of kit had a straight outlet from the sand, from the, on the, the downstream side of the screen, whereas the operator's one had like a U-bend where it kind of kinked up then down. And what was happening was as the slurry was passing or what well, the sand that passed through the screen was it was essentially forming a pressure backlog across the u-bend and it was creating a back pressure based upon the equipment that's an artifact of one bit of a kit from the other so eliminating that is important and one one way to do that is to have the uh, we we've, we've we've theorized is to have make sure you have all the tubulars all the diameter of all the equipment the same as the screen you're using basically eliminate tortuosity have straight flow through the screen so eliminating that as a solution this is a key one in that anyone who's ever been to a sanding or talked about sand retention testing is when you're testing these things at room or lower pressure conditions is you're going to need something to suspend your sand in because if you just do it in brine it's going to all dump onto the screen because you can't suspend sand in it and that's another limitation you can't typically use reservoir flowing fluids because you need to suspend the sand so an example of that is a dense brine. So some of them use a dense brine like formates. Some people use a viscosified brine. So use a gel to viscosify that. And then with that, you've got sort of two different things you've got to do. With a dense brine, you have to continuously agitate the sand. With a viscosified brine, what we've seen is when you pump a viscosified brine through a sand pack as it builds up, it can actually cause like a kind of what we call a quick sand effect. So it doesn't just lay down a dry sand pack. It kind of agitates it and liquefies it as it builds it up. Um, and we can actually see with the viscosified one, you cause resorting and changing of the sand pack as you build it up, which is an obvious artifact. So the question there would be, can we design a system to use native fluids to eliminate this dense phase, viscous phase? So I'll talk a little bit about what we've done to do that shortly as well. And then the last one, I think this one might be a little bit 
I don't know if we've got anyone from, from a vendor on, on the webinar today, but this one might be a little bit, I don't know when to say controversial, but I think it's a question that doesn't get asked very much when we talk about sand retention testing. Most people will use the whole particle size distribution of the reservoir sand in a sand retention test. They will take the sand, disaggregate it, and then use that in um, the in the sand retention test, the whole sand, a subsample of that. I just see there's a question from a look here. Uh, will we get a copy of this? this? You, yes, you absolutely can uh, get asked for a copy of that. You'll get a link to rewatch this presentation. A look almost also asked why such a big difference in the performance of the wire wrap screen from two different manufacturers. It's a really good question because theoretically we should expect to see exactly the same performance because you've got a slot there. But then it's to do with the the you know the 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 geometry of the wires, the geometry of the slots, how this particular sand has interacted with them. Strangely enough, and we do see some differences in the way that the screens perform. It, it we we are constantly surprised by the sand retention testing. How you can see things that you think should be minor differences, creating major differences in the sand look, and it's like uh, it's repeatable as well. It's not just a, a, a sort of a oh, it's a freak result with with the test. We see this repeatable, and it's what, I guess one of the reasons why many people do the sand retention testing. So just back to that whole PSD one, um, using that whole PSD and then putting that against the screen gives us one answer. But then in a real reservoir where we're seeing gentle sand production, do we really think that the whole PSD is going to see the screen at once, or is it more likely that the reservoir production rates are going to pick up some of the finer stuff first, the smaller sand grains, the stuff that's easier to carry, and that's what's going to hit the screens first. In that case, you could argue, that's why I say it might be a bit controversial, is that sand retention tests are overly optimistic and that when we do these tests, we're actually giving the screens an easy ride by testing the whole PSD against them rather than what realistically could flow through the screen, which is something finer than that. So again, I'm not going to talk about it in today's presentation, but we've, we've started doing a series of tests and what we call our baseline first test, we've named it an elutriation test, where we actually see, we've designed a bit of kit to see what physically, at scaled reservoir rates, what sand can physically be carried in the oil, brine, whatever, at those rates, and then using that PSD for the sand retention testing to give something that's a bit closer to reality, but it's going to be harder on the screens. So that's why I say it might be a little bit controversial or asking a question that we're not asking very much, but I think that's a really important one as well. And then just one more thing I want to say is, are we measuring the right thing? Is this flow resistance, pressure, PSD, telling us everything we need to see? Is there other properties of the sand pack that are important to end users? So I'll show you kind of where we're going in the future with that in a, in a couple of slides as well. So overall, I think being closer to reservoir conditions, pressure using the right fluids and removing artifacts are what we need as an industry to be striving to avoid. And I think everyone who dives deep into sand retention testing knows that already. But I want to show you just for a couple of slides, show you the kind of stuff we've been doing on that. We've called it the Advanced Sand Control Simulator. So actually this is, um, you'll see there's a patent number at the bottom. We've showed this to a couple of operators before, but I think this might be the first public uh, webinar or public presentation um, where we've showed this, this in public. And what, what we wanted to do was to design a system that allowed suspension of sand in basically any density of fluids. So we're talking brines, oil, crude oil, refined oil, mineral oil, and potentially even gas. And so what we designed was we designed a system which we had, this is the, we have a see-through version at low pressure so we can prove it works. And we have a pressurized version which operates to high pressure because we want, also wanted to eliminate the high pressure as a con, as consideration. So once you can do it with, with good pressure vessels, you can start to do it at closer to reservoir pressures and maybe even temperature as well. And what we did was we did, we designed an impeller, we got, we got, got an expert in impeller design. And we did some CFD modeling on the, the velocities and what size grains we could we could uh, we could keep uh, entrained in the fluid there. And you can see we've got these we've got these things, and you can see here. So what we designed was we designed a pressure a vessel, which is actually is quite a clever thing. It combines a piston and a suspension system, so we can actually decrease the volume, which as you can see here, this is the this has moved down. This is the, this has got the sand in it now. Earlier on, the sand was all the way in the top. So we can decrease the volume and keep the suspension. And what that has allowed us to do, and we've checked it, we've done it with brine, with refined oil and crude oil. We can actually keep a good sand suspension in that and flow it through a screen. And we're like having no problem with that. And again, we think we might be able to do this with gas as well, which is interesting. So that's the advanced solids control simulator. 
we, we've got some of the other things I talked about, like, and again, we're not going to go into today into the keeping the tubing diameter the same, looking at the size and scale of the screens. But this is just do we, we we use bigger screens cutouts now for the for the advanced solids control simulator. But then we just copied them, copied a standard sand control test to prove the equipment worked. And we were seeing the data is absolutely rock solid from it. So very good data, very comparable data from from that. So I've got a couple of questions. I'm just going to see. I'm just trying to see that. So we've got a look again. Has this concept been implemented anywhere? Sorry, I'm just trying to drag this up. Why well, is this complement not been implemented anywhere? Not using the entire range of PSD, but the filter range only for sand control selection. Absolutely, yeah, look. Uh, whenever we talk about these studies now, we we introduce this concept to the operator. Not everyone does this. Some people say, no, I want to compare it to the entire PSD and what we've done before. Absolutely, I can think of a couple of studies in the last year, big studies where the operator has done this kind of filtration test first and then looked at that selected PSD for the screen selection and they were happy with the results and they got a good uh, selection of screens from that. I just wanted to show you a bit of the advanced sand control simulator data. And then just where we're going in the future, if I want to show you, I see I'm taking longer than I, than I should as I normally do. I want to show you a couple of things on drilling completion, but then what other questions should we be asking? And you'll see again, there's a patent number at the bottom there. We've not showed this very much uh, publicly yet. This is where we're going in the future, which is with the advances we've been doing in CT and micro CT scanning on rock samples, can we utilize that on sand control as well? Because we think that there are other questions which we should be asking in, in sand retention testing, like what is the sorting like of the sand pack that builds up? What is the porosity and permeability of the sand pack? Because it's all very well having a good sand pack, but knowing whether the permeability is low or high, where it is, what the sorting is like, how do the apertures block, and what is the mechanism, where is the blockage of the apertures? We think that's all stuff that the, 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 the people who are selecting sand control hardware want to know. We've showed some of this and some of the other stuff associated with this to operators, and they seem to say, yes, flow resistance is good. Actually, some of this stuff you're showing here is going to be very useful, especially in adding to models, and predicting inflow, predicting the screen failure, predicting pressure drops in the reservoir. This is the kind of stuff we need to do. So this is stuff that is being brought onto the market and watch this space as well. And obviously where it's going longer term is can this be used to upscale? Look at things like permeability across the interface, the velocity in the hardware and across the hardware. Because once you have this in a a model you can do things like computational fluid dynamics and you can start to see flow lines and flow paths through the screens through the sand pack you look at them together or separately and once you can start to do these things you can start to scale up from poor hopefully you can start to build up to reservoir and maybe even field scale predictions now nobody's there yet with this step but once you've got this sort of data set just like we're doing with the core flooding that i've showed in previous webinars this is really applicable in sand control and there's some probably some quite exciting developments to watch for here in the future in terms of scannable apparatus real-time snapshots of sand pack build up on screens there's going to be some good stuff happening here as we go forward so i wanted to show you that as well so as i said this advanced sand control simulator that we've done this is stuff we're doing for operators and we're doing this with the questions that we asked taking those learnings to do better sand retention and then this stuff is going to be really interesting in the future. But just for the last couple, two, three slides, I just want to show you a really important thing to think about. I've talked so long about spending time, money and effort on choosing the best sand control hardware for my reservoir. In other words, choosing the sand control hardware or gravel that I've got in this cartoon here that holds back the sand. But then I think we've got at least in a, in a, in a gravel pack reservoir, We've got at least three interfaces to think about. I've marked it with star. So we have the screening gravel pack. We've got the gravel pack and the, let's say, operational fluid cake, mud cake. And then we've got the well bore, the uh, operational fluid cake in the well bore. Then we've also got an invaded zone. I don't think that it's really an interface, although you could argue it is between the invaded zone and the virgin reservoir where you could see fines dropping out, for example. But I think there's three that we don't necessarily consider all the time. We might do a mud test to see the mud with the rock alone. Does it clean up when we flow back? Yes, good, tick, the mud passes. Screen has been selected, holds back the sand. This is the best screen, best screen and gravel combination, tick, passes. But what about here where we have this mud and the gravel? What if the mud, best mud and best gravel don't work well together? What if the mud gets held back by the gravel? 
what if some of the mud gets caught on the screen and we're getting mud blocking the screen? So we spend all this time and money doing good work on the gravel or hardware and the fluids. What if we don't look at them together? And this is a, a really essential one because not everyone thinks about this. What happens when you do these two forks? Do you join them back together at the end? And this is absolutely essential. Lots of people do think about this, but not everyone does. I'm not gonna stop on this slide. I'm, just gonna, I'm putting it up here just to show you if you're interested in seeing, are there genuine differences between including sand control hardware and not. We wrote a paper uh, two, three years back now with Acre BP in Norway, 185889 on the SPE. And these are the same tests, just with and without uh, screen running fluid and screen is the only addition. And you can see, for example, here, this top test here, the blue represents the improvement in perm after we remove the mud cake and in the right, the mud cake and screen. And what we actually saw was just by including the screen running fluid in screen, we had a, what was a 10% change in perm roughly, it more than doubled there just by including the screen running fluid in the screen, we were transferring damage to the screen and the mud cake itself. And we could see exactly why that happened. And as, if you're interested, look up that paper. There's a whole load of explanation of why we saw differences uh, in the performance. I'll just show you two quick examples of what we could miss by, by, by uh, skipping that. I'm gonna show you these two points here. This is real data, Middle East, plastic reservoir. I won't talk to you exactly what it is, but this is the permeability percentage of the base by permeability. After we built up a mud cake and produced here, we're at about 75%, let's say here, with the mud alone. Then all we did in this second one with a star was add the screen in. And you can see the gap in performance is about 20% when, in, uh, when the best mud and best screen work, work together. And when we took off the screen, took off the screen and looked at it, we saw the mud wasn't coming through in little patches of mud it was basically a, there was mud stuck on the screen so the operator when they knew that you know 20 percent permeability is something that's important but in a field context block screens are probably more worrying than just permeability change because we could start to see things like hot spotting screen failures so they sat up and took notice of this difference in data which would only be identified by looking at the whole system together and they had to compromise on mud design or screen design and what they ended up doing was picking a slightly coarser screen still held back the sound they needed to but it let the mud flow through it and then this is when i talk about cleanup this is an sem image imagine we're sitting in the well here and we're looking back towards the formation and this is a gravel pack well so we've taken off the screen and gravel pack and what we've got left behind here you can see these black areas or pores and we've got this this kind of gray amorphous thing here what this is is sitting under the shadow if you like of the gravel pack that's what these spherical holes are where the gravel pack was sitting we have this thin few tens of microns thick layer of mud and operational fluids that was getting trapped behind the gravel as i said there's an interface there and what was happening was the gravel was a bit too fine. So we were seeing the formation was good. We were seeing some flow around the edge of the gravel, but we were basically seeing the gravel getting blocked by the mud there, and that required a treatment to fix. So these are the kind of things we can miss if we don't include the screen and gravel. And that's all relatively easily examined. You know, this is some examples of data using core flood test equipment. Make sure we look at the drilling mud, the displacement sequence, carrier fluids and hardware all together close to reservoir conditions as possible, if not at reservoir conditions, measure the permeability, and then do things like SEM. This is the interface between the reservoir and the mud cake. You can start to see what the interface looks like. You can do CT scanning. This is micro CT scanning. and looking at the cleanup of the mud. You can see the mud cake permeability, the rock permeability. And this is our technique we call the 3D alteration modeling. And we can actually see where the damage is in the gravel pack. So what we do is we scan the rock before and after and create a map of where the damage is. And you can see here's the reservoir. And we've got some invasion in the reservoir. And we've got, what we're seeing is that the, the interface, as I said, between the reservoir and the gravel, most of the damage is, gent is kind of shallow into the gravel because the mud was getting stuck in the gravel. Then we were seeing a kind of dead zone in the middle where there wasn't much happening. And then we were also seeing some accumulation of the mud it towards the screen here. So this is all really important data as far as I'm concerned, but I've gone on for almost the hour when Jennifer said it be 45 minutes. So I'll just talk through my final thoughts. And if anyone's got any questions, fire them in the, in the Q&A. I think I've answered Alok's questions so far. I think my final thoughts, just to say, you know, sum up everything I've, I've said. I've, I've talked through some of the basics on sand retention, what kind of studies we do. But I hope I've highlighted that just as in core flood testing, Sand retention testing, yes, there are industry standard approaches, but the more specific, the more relevant the data is, 
the more useful it's going to be and the better the decisions are going to be. So we should think about where we're taking compromises. Can we minimize the artifacts that we see in some of the industry standard approaches? I showed you our uh, advanced sand retention equipment. That's something we think is going to be an approach to that. I'm sure there are other approaches. But that's the approach we've taken. And we think closer to reservoir conditions is better. So temperature is the next frontier. Temperature we're looking at as well. Um, a fuller understanding of what goes on in sand packs and screens, we should always be challenging whether the, the data that we get, which, you know, I, I, am I ticking a box by doing a sand retention test, or am I generating relevant and meaningful data that other people within our teams and organization can use, and things like permeability of sand packs, sorting of sand packs, pressure across screens, we think are going to be relevant. And then the last one, I think this is like an absolutely key thing, is, you know, once we have the best sand control hardware, operational fluids, it's absolutely essential to study them together. As I said, that missing that step is a, you know, a quick way of missing something that is going to be very easy to fix before we complete the well, potentially expensive or impossible to remove once we've completed the well. And that allows us to evaluate those options or compromises before they even need to be, uh, anything drastic needs to be done in the field. So as I said, more information is better decisions. So again, thank you for your, thank you for your attention today. Always happy for any questions. We've got a few minutes left at the end now for any questions. My email address is up on the screen. Always happy to take uh, emails and uh, Jennifer's email address is there. Uh, if you like, I have anything about the, the, the webinar, if you'd like to get copies of them. Uh, Khalid is asking, do you have similar experience in case of slotted liners? Uh, yeah, actually, we've, we've been asked to do less testing like sand retention type testing with slotted liners you know, presumably because of the size of the, the slots in them, but for sure in terms of the slides I've showed you previously with the mud passing through the liners, absolutely. We should always say, what, where, where are the chokes going to be in the reservoir? What could be causing damage? And I just don't think just the reservoir is damage. Everything outside the reservoir is damage as well. So screens can be damaged and absolutely valid slotted liners can be and you know it's very important when we're doing these studies to think about getting the ratio for example of the slot to metal right for the core flood and we have absolutely done that in multiple multiple core floods if it's huge if they're pre-drilled huge holes then they're probably not going to be a limit on flow and so we won't worry about using them in a core flood test but if they're quite thin microns th th thick uh, slots or microns wide slots 100 percent, we've done them uh, Alan Twynham, you've asked about sand preparation standards. Have you looked at best prep practice to prepare samples for sand retention testing? As usual, Alan's asking one of these questions, which is absolutely a key question and absolutely one we could probably do a half hour session on because the way we prepare the sand, the way we, so how, what, what sand are we using? How is it cleaned? How is it disaggregated? How do we subsample from that? And then do we use the whole sand? Do we use a portion of that? Then the question, which I, I guess you're alluding to as well, Alan, is what happens if we don't have reservoir sand, if we, if we don't have core? Can we use a separator sand sample? Is that meaningful? Can we use cuttings? Are we sure they're from the right zones of the reservoir? Um, if we don't have any sand at all, is can we make a lab sand or a sand to a given PSD, an analog sand? And these are absolutely key ones because, you know, as I've been saying, the less close you are to reservoir, the worse your data is going to be. The aim with our sand preparation should be to A, avoid artifacts, which I'm pretty confident the industry has eliminated most of the cleaning and preparation artifacts. But representativeness of sand, I think, is still an open question that we have to always be trying to be closer to reservoir. If we have core, we're probably eliminating that. But absolutely big question, Alan. Uh, we've got to MO Mustafa. Currently, we start hearing that the KCL brine may make dispersion for kaolinite and rock and disperse it and be easy to migrate. Absolutely, so you're, you're, you're linking back to a really good question about that early study I showed you, the fines migration, the critical drawdown, the sanding type core flood test. And the question is, if we see sanding and fines migration blocking, is there anything we can do about that? And what I didn't touch upon today is, can we fix that? Because sometimes with sanding and fines migration, we can't fix that. But sometimes we can, we can look at things like chemical consolidation as one or resins. But in terms of fines migration, if we can carry the fines and disperse them and produce them away, then that actually should be a net benefit because we should improve the permeability, stop them getting blocked in the pore throat. So if, for example, what you're talking about there, the KCL disperses them and allows them to flow, brilliant. If it disperses them and then gets them trapped in pore throats, that's not so brilliant. So absolutely there are 
These are things that are commonly looked at in, in studies, uh, but we need to make sure for our individual rock that they work. Generally speaking, a KCL might be something to consider, but specifically speaking, your reservoir is important. Tony Addis uh, for, hi Tony, for intact sands that are expected to fail and produce later in life, how do you disaggregate the sand without generating fine grinds? Yeah, that's another key one. It kind of touches on, on what Alan was, was mentioning as well as when you're, if you have a relatively consolidated sand, what you've got to be extremely careful about is not grinding it to below the grain size, if you like. What, what, I think that's what you're referring to, Tony, there. We want to disaggregate it to individual grains and then not smash individual grains because then you change the PSD, you change the shape of the grains and you make the rock finer overall. So yeah, that's again, that's down to individual lab procedures and following API procedures. Rock disaggregation tends to be a combination of uh, mechanical disaggregation by equipment and then as you get towards your rock being disaggregated, certainly within our lab, we start doing it by hand with mortar and pestle and we do it with, uh, we use um, uh, we, the person who's disaggregating is sitting there with the sand and a binocular microscope and is constantly taking the sand and checking that they're not smashing the grains. So you have, if you're going to be super cautious about it, it's a quite time consuming thing because you're grinding it gently with a mortar and pestle or hard if it's a hard bit of rock. But then you're looking at it under a microscope and making sure you're not smashing sand. I actually thought about putting a picture of that in this presentation. We do have images of a well, a correctly disaggregated piece of rock and a smashed up piece of rock, Tony. So 100% agree that we have to think about that. A look question, uh, a look saying uh, acceptable range of permeability impairment in flow through testing. I presume that's what you mean by FTT, flow through testing. Um, that's a great question because one might say no permeability impairment is acceptable. And that's a good thing to be aiming for. But in reality, some level of permeability impairment tends to be seen in these kind of studies, be it from drilling mud, be it from sanding, be it from fines migration. And then it's down to what is acceptable. I always or we always say that we should be aiming for absolutely minimizing that. However, different operators, different organizations have their internal rules of thumb as what they see as being acceptable. So I'm now talking about drilling fluids for example i can think of two operators who we do a lot of work with and they have a rule of thumb of 20 percent or lower is acceptable for one of them and the other one has 30 percent or lower is acceptable to them i'd say 30 percent is still a relatively high level of damage that we can aspire to taking 30 percent to 20 percent can have a big economic impact but people tend to have their own personal rules of thumb that they're willing to willing to have there but <laughs> from a formation damage lab guy no permeability uh, impairment is what we should be aiming for. Realistically, we're always going to see some and we should be just aiming to minimize that as much as possible. And it does depend on the reservoir itself, the permeability type, the thickness of the reservoir, you know, the rates that the reservoir is producing. Where is the choke? Because in some reservoirs, let's say a low perm reservoir, the choke might be the formation. So we need to absolutely minimize formation damage. And in some reservoirs, the the, the damage itself may not start becoming a choke until higher levels of damage, which is where, you know, and upscaling and modeling improvements, information damage may plug into that. You know, we might understand that we can live with this 20 to 30 percent. And once we start hitting, I'm just picking numbers out of the air here, 40 or 50 percent, we need to be concerned. So there's more than just flow through testing or core flood testing to take into account. But what we absolutely can see in the core flood testing is orders of magnitude, things we could be avoiding potential mechanisms we're going to see in the field. Hopefully that answers your question, Alok. Now, I'm not seeing any more questions appearing. So um, as I said, if you've got any questions, you can see my email address on the screen, see Jennifer's. Uh, we're going to do some more of these. And um, as as, a, as Jennifer's said earlier on, we're, please keep an eye on our LinkedIn for them. And we're always happy to do specific webinars for you. If there's anyone here who wants one on a specific subject, drop Jennifer or me a line. And we're always happy to talk about doing one just for you. Uh, on a specific subject of your choice. So with that, I'll hand over to uh, Jennifer just to wrap up. Thank you, Justin. Thank you everyone for your time. I know we went slightly over there. Um, it's not often easy getting an hour together at times. So we appreciate you being here and we hope you've, we've been able to give you some value in the last hour or so. Um, yeah, as Justin said, any further questions, just feel free to contact us. 
Um, there was a question earlier in the presentation about access to the slides and recording. We will be sending them out for email tomorrow, so you can revisit the slides then if you would like. Um, there's also some great videos and technical content being posted on Premier Offfield Group and Premier Corex YouTube channels. So if you hit subscribe to these channels, you'll be able to get updated on more content as we release them. Um, we are keeping our schedules moving, as you can see, and we've got some good webinars upcoming. So Justin's scheduled to be back in a couple of weeks with our next formation damage mechanisms webinar. Um, he'll be giving us some insight into the most common formation damage mechanisms, how they manifest, what impact they have on the reservoir, and most importantly, if we want to avoid them, how can they be identified? So watch out for that one on the 23rd of July. I'm just going to push you through a little poll here if you have time, just to answer quickly. We do like to give you sessions and technical content that you like to see. So if you've got any preference for a next topic in our formation damage series, then do let us know. It should be up on your screen now. Um, yeah, we're always willing to host webinars and sessions that you like to see. So if you've got time, just answer now. I think the preference here is acid stimulation so far. So we will look to bring you that in the next few weeks shortly. Jules Reed will be back in a couple of weeks as well on the 9th of July, <coughs> our next core analysis and EOR series. So that'll be an interesting one actually, as Jules will take a look back at his 30 years of industry experience and talk us through some of the general learnings of carrying out core analysis experiments and reviewing data results. Justin mentioned as well, you can always see more information, registration details, etc., on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter pages, etc. So we look forward to seeing you at future sessions if you're able to make it. I think that is all from us today now. Um, we do thank you again for joining us. Sorry we ran over slightly, but yeah, we'll see you in a few weeks time if you're able to join us.